Uh, I'll just start with one or two questions of my own, um, Tom, and maybe just pick up on where you left off uh, while it's fresh in everyone's minds uh, on the shale gas um, development in the UK. Um, so you've highlighted, obviously, the challenges for the European chemicals industry with cheap ethane propelling the US industry, and we've had a lot of talk about that over the last day or two. Uh, and you, you referenced at the end about the incentives to convince both those sort of communities and, you know, obviously the government's case mm. to, to push for shale gas. There has been some resistance. Do you think there's a risk of it being this, this initiative from both INEOS and others campaigning for shale development in the UK being derailed? I mean, how long will that process of convincing take, do you think, and how costly is it going to be? Uh, uh, it'll take some time. I mean, uh, to be honest, the, we, we're only at the start of a process. We're going to spend the next two years basically test drilling. Um, so we're two, at least two years away from any commercial production. So we have that window to keep working on this issue of winning hearts and minds. We've been doing that for the last two years, so we'll probably have four or five years of work sitting in small villages and, and small towns talking to people. The art for us is to start that process in the areas that need the jobs mm -hmm. and need the economic benefit most. And by coincidence, most of the old coal mining areas tend to be where the shale is. They've lost a huge amount of jobs with the decline of coal mining, and a lot of them are very welcoming of us coming in. Do you think there's any chance or any talk uh, of, as you said, you outlined legally how it's structured in the US, where if you own the land, you own the resources. Mm -hmm. Is there any, would the, would the UK government in any way look to change the law similarly to make this process happen quicker? Yeah, I, I don't think I they'll mean, change the law, but we are seeing already significant change from the government. First of all, we persuaded them very early on that us giving away this 6% of essentially their money uh, was a good thing. Um, they recognized that having 94% of something was better than 100% of nothing. Um, and secondly, they have also, in addition to our initiative, launched what they're calling a shale wealth fund, where they will take a significant portion of their earnings and put that back into communities as well. So they recognize that this is an essential part of the, the plan. Okay, and I mean, as you said, it's, it's, it's a few years for this, hopefully, to materialize. And in the interim, the plan is, for example, companies like Enios are still importing uh, ethylene, cheaper ethylene for, for their uh, facilities in, in, in Europe. Is that now fully operational in terms of the projects that you're... Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. We, the, the ethane imports are now fully operational into both uh, Norway and to the UK. Uh, as a, the biggest, it, uh, our Norwegian cracker was running 50-50 ethane LPG. It's now 100% ethane. Our uh, uh, Scottish cracker was running at less than half rate because we simply couldn't physically get the ethane from the North Sea. Um, that cracker is now running full for the first time in eight years as a result of this. Um, and we, the, the side benefit of this is that we, we also are uh, completing a project uh, jointly with, with Graham's company and Exxon to provide some of that gas f up into their cracker in Scotland as well. So there'll be a, a significant benefit for the industry. And any, any immediate plans for, for other projects in the pipeline? Or, uh, or is we, uh, we have a, a lot of projects in North America at the moment, taking advantage of, of the, the benefits that we talked about, uh, just like Graham. Um, and we're also looking at downstream projects for uh, uh, our Scottish operation as a result of now having a very competitive source of ethylene. Okay, well, I'm going to thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. I'm going to go to a couple of questions here. Um, let's see. <laughs> okay, well, well, one just related again to shale gas, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come to you, Graham. Uh, one of the resources for shale gas is water injection. Uh, as drinking water is projected to become more scarce, what are your thoughts on this? What's the impact on drinking water resources? I mean, w water is a significant issue. There's no question, and I mean, one of the and it is one of the limiting factors in some parts of the world for shale development. I think you know in China it's proving to be a, a quite a challenge. Um, it's less of a challenge in in the UK because the UK is pretty wet. Um, uh, and, and you also have to put into context, uh, one well will use about the same amount of water as a golf course would use in a month. Um, so, so that's the, the, the balance that we have to inject into that discussion. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Graeme, I'd like to go to you and, and, and sort of bring the, bring the conversation perhaps back to the GCC uh, uh, and ask you, I mean, you obviously covered a lot of ground there in your, in your presentation. What would you, I'd want to ask you, what would you see 
with that, all with the di dynamic sort of situation that we're seeing, both from a feedstock perspective and other, what would you see as the fundamental shift that the GCC industry here is going to have to do in the next five years? What's the most immediate priority, do you think, that they have to do to adjust to these new dynamics in the global uh, yeah, I, mean, I think you know it's been it was quite well discussed yesterday. Uh, I mean, something I'd probably emphasise, which maybe wasn't so well touched on, was you know I think all of us as as companies, because ultimately we're we're individual companies, as Ineos, Shell, Aramco, Sabic, um, everybody needs to play to their strengths. So, what makes sense for a Shell, or what makes sense to an Ineos, or what makes sense to an Aramco, or what makes sense to a Sabic is they should be different. For, for all sorts of very logical reasons. You know, Ramco is sitting on a vast resource base, uh, so one of its primary considerations is actually making sure those hydrocarbons get moved. Uh, I think there was a, there was a great uh, quote that somebody said yesterday, you know, the Stone Age didn't end because people ran out of stones. Uh, so uh, I think we all need to play to, play to our strengths, and I think the, the individual companies of uh, the GCC will need to do the same. I think if you think about, you know, there was quite a lot of uh, talk yesterday about specialty chemicals. Mm. I think specialty chemicals comes with some challenges. Um, obviously, it's a it is a different skill base from the more upstream uh, chemical base. But, you know, most of all, uh, I think you, you would like to have proximity to key markets. You know, you would like to have a lot of proximity to... Uh, industries like the automotive industry, for example, uh, to really uh, to get into the tailoring. Um, uh, clearly, the Gulf has substantial populations, different countries, uh, but the development of those industries is equally important. So I think uh, at, at, a, at a systemic level, uh, I think indeed the, the, you know, the working progressively into technology, looking at specialty chemicals, but I think they, there also needs to be policies directed to the systemic development of the entire economies. Uh, I think development of uh, specialty chemicals on its own without the development of uh, complementary industries uh, will be quite challenging. I think beyond that, obviously, uh, as I think was well talked about yesterday, things like uh, continuous improvements in productivity, uh, improving the underlying competitiveness of uh, the fixed cost base mm -hmm. is incredibly important, uh, Im important to look at because one of the things that I hinted at in, in my speech was that you know, the world is now uh, filled with uh, the Gulf and North America are, are fundamentally uh, looking at cheap variable cost but relatively expensive capital and fixed cost. And China, in contrast, is basically higher in variable cost, but it's very cheap in fixed mm. and capital. So you've got these two mm. competing systems. For us, it makes sense to basically then have a diversified portfolio. Uh, in a higher oil price environment, you will basically win more in the f uh, out of the former strategy and less in, in the latter, for all the reasons that Tom pointed out very well in terms of the energy consumption of a lot of, uh, of our products. But in a lower oil price environment, uh, actually, the Chinese build cost is quite a, quite a challenge for mm -hmm, both mm -hmm. North America and, uh, and the GCC to deal with. Okay, I'd mm -hmm. like to ask you a bit about technology and, and the importance of that, obviously, in, in, in all industries. I mean, Shell, as a company itself, has restructured dramatically in the last 15 years. It's become more of a gas company. It's obviously very, very uh, pioneering in the technology that it's, it's, it's using and developing. So how important is it to the GCC industry here to have those partnerships with companies like Shell from a technology standpoint? Um, you know, is the indigenous technology that's, that's being looked at here uh, enough or, or are those partnerships absolutely still critical? Well, I think many, you know, many companies, I think uh, uh, Dr. al Sadun uh, very uh, articulately described this at the beginning of, of today uh, in the case of Sabic, uh, you know, have progressively diver diversified uh, with a strategy to start to pick up a, a technological capability, and I think that makes complete sense. Um, and so the codependency will shift over time. Um, I think it's easiest to speak for our own strategy. Uh, you know, our own strategy, fundamentally, we see ourselves ultimately as a technology company. Uh, the foundation of everything we do, yes it, yes, it turns out in terms of mega projects and big assets and so on, but the, the underpinning of all of those things is ultimately technology. So for us, we see our, our long-term competitiveness coming from, from ultimately technology, regardless of where we apply that technology and how we've applied that over the past. 
uh, and we will naturally seek to see uh, to seek partnerships with those for whom uh, perhaps they have less technology strength, but they bring something else, and then there's a natural uh, there's a natural fit. I think you know if if you have uh, partners who have the same strengths as you, you, it doesn't end up being a particularly excellent marriage. You need you need to have a complement uh, set of skills well, to really make here for a good marriage. Well, the question is directed towards you, which is is Shell planning any new joint ventures in the DCC? Can you? I mean, what, what you well, I'm not, I'm not going to announce anything brand new as of uh, <laughs> right now. Uh, but I but are there any natural synergies that you've just, you know, that oh, absolutely. That uh, you've I mean, just mentioned? I, you know, I, I gave the simple example in, in my speech of, uh, of our collaboration with the government of Iraq. And, uh, you know, I think clearly, uh, as I think they would say themselves, you know, it, Iraq is a more challenged country. Uh, but, uh, but clearly for countries like Iraq, bringing mm -hmm. employment to younger people is clearly a secret to uh, ultimately dealing with some of the underpinnings of social unrest. Uh, and as we all know, uh, petrochemicals and the associated development of industry uh, with petrochemicals can actually provide that employment so that young people have got something fundamentally better to do than, than obviously what uh, some of what we see in yeah. the region. And, and we're prepared to uh, spend time and energy on looking to co-develop that with them. Uh, we obviously have to manage the risk profile together, uh, but I think it's you know it's an extremely uh, challenging but also an extremely rewarding thing to be involved with the development of a country which hopefully will become uh, much more peaceful in the future and will prosper. Yeah, I mean you mentioned Iraq and and in Iran also yesterday there was some talk about new pet chem capacity uh, uh, which is going to come out of there. Obviously now with sanctions having been lifted not only their oil production, but, but the downstream side as well. So how, how soon would you say y you would see countries like Iraq and Iran come, come online again downstream in any significant way in this region? I mean, I'm sure it'll be quite quick. In the the geopolitics. Uh, I'm sure it'll be quite quick. And they, you know, they're sitting on vast gas reserves. Uh, and obviously, they've been relatively constrained in that space. I think you know, the thing that, that everybody has to be conscious of is uh, uh, sanctions can come and go and come again. Yeah. So um, obviously we see the U.S. elections, and who knows uh, uh, how Donald Trump, Trump will uh, emerge uh, in terms of his real policies. But but clearly you always have to be conscious of uh, of the, the the sanctions environment can uh, can ebb and flow. And so I think that will be a, always a concern for people seeking to invest multiple billions uh, mm -hmm. in in a country like Iran. But clearly it's got enormous uh, resources uh, and a very talented people. Okay, I have a good question up here actually on uh, shale, but back to shale again. I'm not sure where it's disappeared, but I just saw it. Will shale development uh, impact or, or derail investment into renewables? Um, I think you can possibly both comment on that, but I'll go back to you, Tom, first in terms of priorities. You know, with uh, shale being so cost effective and quick, sure. and renewables obviously is more of a long term. Uh, I, I mean, my short answer to that is absolutely not. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't distinguish shale from conventional. It's gas, and I believe gas is essential to renewables development. Um, not only, as, as Andre, Andre so eloquently put it at the end of his talk, uh, we're providing the basic building blocks for the renewables industry, uh, but also because it's the ideal complementary fuel. Uh, you need power to back up renewables, uh, and the most effective in terms of lowest CO2, most cost effective and easiest to control is gas. So I, I believe it's absolutely complementary. I agree with that. Um, right. I, the one uh, addition I'd make to Tom's comment is that you know, one of the biggest challenges in decarbonisation is coal. Yeah. Uh, you know, coal is by far the highest uh, CO2 intensity fuel. Um, clearly, there's going to be a challenge uh, in both India and China in terms of, of use of coal. Um, but for the rest of society, uh, uh, gas replacement of coal is one of the easiest uh, and simplest ways uh, for global society to make a fast run at decarbonisation. Then you add on to that uh, renewables at the same time and you can actually, and, and in fact, you look at things like the IEA's energy scenarios, um, looking at how to achieve a two degree world. Uh, they've all got displacement of coal by gas yep. as a key uh, enabler. Okay, thank you. And I've got one interesting question here, on uh, which is a bit more I suppose, political, but it, it impacts uh, investment decisions. Uh, does INEOS see any impact on its business from the Brexit? <laughs> I mean, how, how is that going to possibly impact your strategy? 
uh, in Europe, uh, uh, we 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 would say difference? we would say no. We don't see any impact. I mean, look, clearly the, the the impacts are almost impossible to forecast because nobody knows what Brexit, what Brexit means. <laughs> um, but we've always taken a view that we will manage our business accordingly. I mean, we run operations within Europe that are both in and out of the EU. We've got a very big operation in Norway, which sits outside. Big operations, obviously, in Germany, which sits inside. So we'll manage our business. We don't think it's going to have a long-term impact. I think one one addition I'd make is that I think there's a huge role for business yep. uh, in this debate uh, because I think nearly everyone uh, in business recognises that uh, trade barriers between uh, the UK as a very large economy within uh, within Europe and the rest of Europe is actually a lose-lose yep. uh, for business. Uh, you know, it's a lose for German, German automotives. It's a it's a lose for the financial sector in the UK. So uh, it's in no one's interest, fundamentally, as is, is, uh, industry sectors, and certainly the chemical industry has yep. the same view in Europe. So I think the, uh, the business community playing a substantial role in Europe, uh, both sides of, uh, of the water, as we might say, uh, to push politicians away from, let's say, politically entrenched positions mm -hmm. into uh, uh, economically sane ones, I think is a, is a very key role. Uh, I mean, I just say, I mean, I, as, as president of the UK's Chemical Industry Association, I've already had extensive meetings with government on this over the last three months. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it's pretty clear that the, for the manufacturing sector, I don't see a major problem because there is a, a great balance in trade between the UK and the rest of Europe and neither side want to damage that. It's more of a challenge in the service sector uh, where the UK as major financial services centre is, is looked at with envy from the rest of Europe and I think there'll, there'll be more challenges there than there will be for manufacturing. Yeah. And what about, just I'll, have, I'll put one more question uh, to you gentlemen before we wrap this up, uh, what about the impact of the potential trade policies that are going to come out of the Trump administration. Obviously, we had a lot of talk before he was elected on essentially closing down some, some trade uh, you know, internationally. So, so what, what are your expectations for that and, and how could that impact this industry? Well, again, it's difficult to say when we don't know what he's intending to do, but I think, as Graham already said, anything that reduces global trade is not a good thing. Uh, I think, uh, as an industry, we are dependent on free global trade movements, um, and, and we wouldn't want to see them closed down. Um, on, on the positive side, from an energy sector point of view, I think uh, he is highly unlikely to do anything that will undermine uh, the development of the energy sector. It's key to the US, um, which is a good thing. Um, so it's, it's balance. It's good. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Please uh, let's give our thanks to Mr. Van Toff and Mr. Cossie for their thoughts this, this morning. Thank you, gentlemen. If you'd like to take your seat.